we kind of looked around and saw there's no science fiction festival that looks at science fiction the way we look at it. And you're going to see how we, as a team, the Utopia team, looks at science fiction, which is the reason I came over to, to talk about science fiction, which is like a, 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 a strong force in my life. Um, so I call myself a science, fi a science fiction evangelist. Uh, which is, a, I guess, a good way, a good spin on science fiction geek. My goal here is to have you all uh, uh, at the end of this talk as bigger appreciators and hopefully better equipped ambassadors of science fiction. And to the needy greedy, let's see. Okay, so science fiction. Um, it's a highly creative storytelling art form, uh, both narrative and aesthetic. Um, it's a source for unbound inspiration for scientists and entrepreneurs and engineers and designers. It's also a great way to interact with kids about STEM education and to engage the wider public uh, with science, technology and innovation um, issues. But I like to take all these wonderful traits aside and talk to you about science fiction from a very different angle. And I'll use the help of Slavoj Žižek, Slovenian philosopher. Um, this is him at the Occupy Wall Street uh, protests back in 2011. This is Zuccotti Park in New York. And he gave a speech there, and at, as part of the speech he told a joke, which I'd like to reiterate to you. And it's a joke from old communist times. Um, a guy from East Germany um, is being sent to Siberia to work in Siberia. And he wants to keep in touch with his friends, but he knows that his letters are going to be read and censored. So he says, okay, let's, let's make up a code. Let's have a code. If I write a letter and the ink is blue, it means that the letter is true. If I use red ink, it means that it's false. Great. He goes away, a month passes, and the first letter arrives. And lo and behold, the letter is all blue ink. And what does it say? It says, I've arrived. The weather is wonderful. The streets are clean. The restaurants are full. The cinemas are showing great films from the West. My apartment is large and luxurious. The only thing I cannot get anywhere is red ink. Mm -mm. Sorry. So. Science and technology over the past uh, few centuries have, have unraveled millennia of social constructs and eons of biology, and we all feel the extreme impacts of the digital revolution of the last few decades on our politics, on our jobs, on our relationships. And over the past same two centuries, a new genre of narrative and aesthetic came to be, and it's a genre that explores and discusses those revolutions that we are experiencing. Science fiction has become science and technology's, I think, best or chief spokesperson, but also one of its greatest critics. For thousands of years, a conversation about the future was not really different than a conversation about the present or the past. All that we needed was different tenses. Now, science fiction is not just this wonderful creative art form, it's a veritable necessity for us to formulate our ideas and think and talk about tomorrow. Science fiction enables us a linguistic and aesthetic vocabulary for a discussion about current technologies and their effect on us, and as yet, non-existing technologies. And this is where I want to call back Shishak, because tomorrow's reality is based on today's choices. And the science fiction vocabulary serves us not only for the unknowns of tomorrow, but also for the hiddens of today. We supposedly live in free societies, but we lack the language with which to articulate our non-freedoms. The vocabulary we all learn or we all utilize is mostly the vocabulary of capitalism and the war on terror. And that vocabulary sometimes distorts misuses, and sometimes even falsifies words and concepts. Words and concepts like democracy, like information, like terrorism, and like freedom. 
And I'd like to suggest to you science fiction, not just as a, our linguistic and aesthetic vocabulary for the future, but also as our red ink of today. And I won't leave this in the philosophical and abstract. I'll give you a few examples, hopefully for your use as science fiction ambassadors. And there's no, I don't know of a better way to start a conversation at the intersection of science fiction, technological innovation, social change, and language than that of the robot. Um, I don't think I need to establish science fiction credentials here. Um, the genre has had a remarkable impact and influence over not just the science of robotics, but the social and cultural perception of robotics. And I'm sure some of you know, and to whom, you d to whom who doesn't yet, I'm going to tell the origin story of the robot, or specifically the word robot. Show of hands, who knows? Who knows the story of the robot? One? You might. Okay. So the, the word robot isn't 100 years old. It was first coined in a 1921 play, a science fiction play by a Czech playwright by the name of Karl Čapek. The play is Russum's Universal Robots. And the word robot, derived from a Slavic word, robota, which has the connotation, the reference to labor, work, but the more precisely, forced or slave labor. And those are exactly the robots in Chapex play. They're artificially created laborers, slave laborers, that replace human beings in dangerous, difficult, um, or monotonous tasks. Now, while we might envision, whoop, spoilers, we might envision these as robots, humanoid mechanicals, with or without a beer or a cigar, his robots, the first robots, were nothing like these robots. These were the first robots. Now, granted, this is a play, but the play called for them to be not only uh, biological, but also to be mistaken for human beings. Very far, very far from the mechanical automatons that we all know uh, from science fiction and from reality today. In current terms, we would not call these robots. We might call them clones, but they're not genetic facsimiles. What I believe we would use is the word android, such as Data from Star Trek or Roy Batty from Blade Runner. And that's fascinating because the word android predates the word robot by centuries. In fact, human beings were making androids as of the 15th century. And how is that possible? This is an android. So, a human-like mechanical automaton, part puppet, part mechanical clock. So, there was al already a word for a mechanical, human-like, complex machine. But it's the word robot, with its connotations of slave labor and replacing human labor, that captures the, media, the media's attention and the people's imagination. Here are a few news clippings from the 1920s. A robot guides, guides subway riders in London. The robot policeman, police officer, uh, that uh, replaced the police officer. We now know these as ticket booths or ticket stations and traffic lights. But in South Africa, the original name persists, by the way. I've had this studied. Those are actual photos. So. Why robot? I would claim to you that it has a lot to do with the social, economic, um, political landscape of that time. Human beings were treated as machines on the assembly line, and they were replaced by machines, and not only in manufacturing. And along comes Chapex play with exactly that word that only, not only describes the technology, but also the social, political, um, phenomenon and the mass fear, the mass psychological fear from it. So, the first robot story, Chapek's story, is also the first robot uprising story, the first robot apocalypse. They rise and they destroy all humans. So, these have been extremely popular ever since, 
And while they're wonderfully entertaining, and I love them as much as anyone else, they have a dangerous potential because they cater to our technophobia. And why are we so technophobic, uh, asks Samuel L. Jackson in the recent Robocop remake. The phobia is inherent to the term itself, to the term robot, which is why one of the things I do at, we do at Utopia is advocating for um, science fiction creativity that explores um, c more complex visions of the technological society that we live in. We need less of Chapex creations and less man versus machine, us versus them scenarios, such as the Terminators and Ultrons and Silence of other rebellious robots of the world. We need more HALs from 2001, more Datas, more uh, cases from Interstellar, which I hope uh, some of you have seen, and definitely more Samanthas from her. Um, I'm glad we, see we have some science fiction aficionados here. Um, the second example I want to give you, sorry, uh, I'd like to discuss from our future lexicon, is, from, is a concept that was first envisioned in 1956 by Philip K. Dick. It was turned into a film, you know the film, the Steven Spielberg 2000 film, Minority Report. And now, the production on this film was incredible. Uh, they've done wonderful work with scientists and engineers to imagine, design, and create on screen a tech plausible future for the year 2053. Now, touch screens and personalized com commercials, they came by um, a little bit closer than 2053. Autonomous cars will also be among this soon. But the interesting idea explored, the most interesting idea explored in the film is that of pre-crime. So, the first thing you, know, you need to know about pre-crime is that it works. What is pre-crime? What if we could stop people a mere few seconds prior to them committing a crime and arrest them for the intent to commit it? That is the main premise for Minority Report and it obviously evokes um, a lot of philosophical questions about law enforcement and uh, punishment and about justice. And the ability to do that in the film and in the story are fantas is fantastical. There's no basis in science and technology to do that in the film. But law enforcement agencies in the US and China and intelligence and counterterrorism groups everywhere are exploring this idea. And the technology or one of the technologies that they're exploring is big data. I'm sure some of you have heard of this. Analyzing hum huge amounts of information, looking for patterns, and calculating a communities, a groups, and to some extent, it's some, an individual's chances of committing a, a crime or even a terror act. Now, this would definitely cut lines in airports. It would make stuff a lot easier in huge sports events like the Olympics, or for film festivals, or for uh, music festivals. It will increase productivity, it will increase efficiency, and it will increase profits. It will put criminals behind bars and it will prevent terror attacks. It will save lives and it will improve lives. And I'm going to invoke Zizek again. Because I hope you've noticed that the language I was using to describe the benefits of pre-crime was that of capitalism and war on terror. But what would it do to the average non-white person anywhere? Or to the ex-convict, someone who's been in jail and served his time? With the rhetoric we see in the US and some parts of Europe and elsewhere, what would it do? How would these systems react to immigrants, to refugees, or to any singled out or marginalized group anywhere? Can we weed out bigotry from algorithms written by human beings? And how do we resist these systems? So these are open questions. I don't have any answers for them. Where well, I have one, actually, I have one. And the one answer is our third and last word from the future lexicon. I imagine you can guess what word it will be. 
um, it's, a, it's not a new word, but it was infused with new power and significance over the past two or three decades. Anyone want to guess the word? Anonymous. The text, the science fiction text, is V for Vendetta. Um, both graphic novel by Alan Moore and the film adaptation by the Wachowskis tell a very different story, but they both emphasize and discuss the power of anonymity. Now, the film is currently celebrating its 10th anniversary, and it actually gave the literal and virtual face to an entire movement dedicated to anonymity. I don't think I need to convince anybody, anyone here about the power or the significance or the importance of anonymity in the digital age, but I will say this. Anonymity is presented by some as a synonym for terrorism or crime. And I think it's important to reiterate again and again and again how much stronger a synonym it is for human rights, for civic rights, and for freedom. And let's sum up. Science fiction, um, that's, that's how we perceive science fiction in, in, in Utopia. It's a laboratory for big visionary out of this world ideas. It's a place that celebrates the possible and even more so the impossible, the ludicrous and the absurd. The only way to discover the limits of the possible is to, to, is to go beyond them into the impossible. That's one of the best quotes from Arthur C. Clarke. And that's the core of science fiction. Science fiction is a voyage of discovery. It's a challenge to our conceptions. It's, um, science fiction creatives are explorers. Every, every step they take into the unknown um, expands our horizons, expands our universe, expands our imagination, and expands our language. This is a great chandelier I saw at this at this art exhibit. Big Brother, cyberspace, virtual reality, the computer virus, the atomic bomb, the technological singularity, Newspeak, hive mind, the matrix, pre-crime, and the robot. All these words, these concepts, and many, many others, enable us conversations that we were not able to have prior. Conversations about the scientific, technological, uh, digital revolutions that we're going through. But even more important than that, they are the red ink that we all need, and need it now. Once again, these are my handles, and I hope you go out as better equipped ambassadors of science fiction. And to quote my childhood icon, thank you, and live long and prosper.